So let's continue to explore these questions and ideas as we take a tour of the Van Cortlandt House Museum. Let's go. Hello, hello, all those beautiful faces. How we doing, how we doing? Miss Edmonds checking in, and today I'm here at Van Cortlandt Park, and behind me is the Van Cortlandt House Museum. This land was first purchased by Van Cortlandt in 1690, and this house was built in the 1700s and used until the 1800s. We're gonna learn more about the Van Cortlands and the history of this land in a minute. But first, I wanted to explain to you the reason why we're here today and to introduce you to our new unit of study, the Enlightenment. So let's start by defining the Enlightenment, giving it some historical context, connecting it to 2020. Why does something that happened back in the 1700s, 1800s matter today in 2020 in the United States? And then we'll start to make sense of it by exploring the Van Cortlandt House. Let's start by defining the Enlightenment and giving you some historical context. Here's the definition I like. This definition is from the British Library. According to them, the Enlightenment the Great Age of Reason is defined as the period of rigorous scientific, political, and philosophical discourse or conversations that characterized European society during the long 18th century, from the late 17th century or the late 1600s to the ending of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815. This was a period of huge change in thought and reason, which in the words of historian Roy Porter, was decisive in making of modernity. Centuries of custom and tradition were brushed aside in favor of exploration, individualism, tolerance, and scientific endeavor, which in tandem with developments in industry and politics witnessed the emergence of the modern world. And out of that modern world, so too came the liberal tradition the tradition on which this country was founded. And those ideas are associated with four of the major Enlightenment philosophers, John Locke, Rousseau, Montesquieu, and Voltaire. John Locke is best known for his idea known as natural rights, or life, liberty, and property. The idea that you are born with certain rights. Nobody gives you those rights like a king. Instead, government is meant to protect those rights for you. And along with that, Rousseau's idea of the social contract means that you make an agreement with the government that they're going to protect those rights for you. And if they fail to uphold that agreement, you as the people have the right to revolt against them and establish a new government. And speaking of government, that's where Montesquieu comes in. And Montesquieu posited that a government in order to best maintain this social contract, this agreement with the people, it should have three separate branches of government. And these branches will check each other's power. You'll have the executive branch, the person who is meant to enforce the laws. You'll have the legislative branch, the branch who makes the laws. And you'll have the judicial branch, the branch who determines if those laws are according to the agreement. And then along with that, you have Voltaire. And Voltaire, his big idea was freedom of speech. Indeed, in order to maintain such a robust system of freedoms and rights protected by the government, you as an individual, as a citizen, need to be able to voice your opinion. And he may or may not have said this, but he is known for saying, I may not agree with what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And it is the ideas of these four men, along with other traditions of the Enlightenment, that comprise of the liberal tradition that the founders of the United States used when crafting the Constitution. So I know at this point many of you are thinking, yeah, yeah, miss, I know the Constitution, American history, these guys had good ideas, it's an election year, but so what? What do they really know about 2020? About right here, right now, in the Bronx? How can we use their ideas to move our country forward? And my answer is, every day we're making history. 
we're redefining and re-understanding our relationship with that history and what it means for our path forward. Right now, there are two narratives competing for our attention, competing for our understanding of our country, how it was formed, and what it will mean for us to move forward. And for our purposes, those two narratives will be represented by, on the one hand, the New York Times 1619 Project, and on the other hand, the 1776 Unites Project. First, the New York Times Project was released just over a year ago in August of 1619, 400 years after 1619, when slaves first landed on the shores of America. And this is what they have to say. In August of 1619, a ship appeared on this horizon near Point Comfort, a coastal port in the English colony of Virginia. It carried more than 20 enslaved Africans who were sold to the colonists. No aspect of the country that would be formed here has been untouched by the years of slavery that followed. On the 400th anniversary of this fateful moment, it is finally time to tell our story truthfully. The 1619 Project is an ongoing initiative from the New York Times Magazine that began in August 2019, the 400th anniversary of the beginning of American slavery. It aims to reframe the country's history by placing the consequences of slavery and the contributions of Black Americans at the very center of our national narrative. Then, just this past month, in response to the 1619 Project, 1776 Unites released their own essays and curriculum. And this is what they have to say about what they released. 1776 Unites is a movement to liberate tens of millions of Americans by helping them become agents of their own uplift and transformation by embracing the true founding values of our country. 1776 Unites represents a nonpartisan and intellectually diverse alliance of writers, thinkers, and activists focused on solutions to our country's greatest challenges in education, culture, and upward mobility. 1776 Unites is a movement to shape the American future by drawing on the best of its past. Radically pragmatic and unapologetically patriotic, we hope to speak for Americans of all races, creeds, and political convictions who oppose the efforts to demoralize and demonize our country and its foundations from within, and to turn its people against one another with false history and grievance politics. We acknowledge that racial discrimination exists and work towards diminishing it, but we dissent from contemporary groupthink and rhetoric about race, class, and American history that defames our national heritage, divides our people, and instills helplessness among those who already hold within themselves the grit and resilience to better their lot in life. So let's continue to explore these questions and ideas as we take a tour of the Van Cortlandt House Museum. Let's go. We are now entering a vibe. Now I don't got no fear of death, I'm curious about what's next. I'm trying to make a future from moments I recollect. I hate the new era they kept like Mitchell and Ness. When I cook up in the school, I feel like Bubba the chef. Got the hometown with me, I'm starting to feel like a leader. The frankness and respect, I'm starting to feel like a reader. I got yeah. yeah, is it okay if I film? I'm doing a virtual, um, what's it called, virtual field trip for my students. Um, let me double check. Okay. In the thriller jacket, got it zipped up, just look at the crowd reaction. I'm grinding till the day that the present become the passes, and I'm chilling in the future, reminiscing and just everything. Stephanie Edmonds for 1 o'clock. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we got permission to record, and now we got to... Go right up here to the museum. Closest homies to do, yeah, it's a lot of snakes here. Man, my city is Medusa. I'm a king sharing dreams on the mic like Martin Luther. Do you so as we enter, you may notice it's a little bit dark in here. That's because they put coverings over the windows to protect the furniture and help preserve everything. So as we come in here, that was actually the back door. And right here is the front door. So the back door was probably added after the original Van Cortlandt died and his son had to move in here with his sisters and a whole bunch of other family members. So they added on to it, made an L-shaped pattern and built up 
three stories. So we're going to be walking through those three stories today and seeing how the Van Cortlands lived and discussing those narratives that are living side by side, often hypocritical to one another and how that relates to that American story today. So as you can see, this staircase right here behind me is one of those things that's gonna point to the status of the Van Cortlands. It's very expensive, it's big, and it lets everybody know they have that high social status because they can spend money on something that's decorative and not necessarily as useful as other types of staircases. <laughs> Here we go with this again yeah. Here we go with this again yeah. As we go up the steps, you'll notice that there's various pictures that line the walls. This one is a view of New York City, the southwest view of New York City, looking up into uh, Manhattan. You can see there's British flags because, again, at the time that this house was established was before the American Revolution. America was a British colony before it became the United States. This was actually one of the sites of the Revolutionary War. It was used by the British and by Washington. And so we see pictures here of that battle. This is the death of General Montgomery. So again, keep that time period in mind. This is the same time period of the Enlightenment. So even though we're in the Bronx, we're Van Cortland, this is the same time that over in Europe, the enlightenment is happening. Golden hour, golden hour. Oh, if she blooms just like a golden flower. Golden flower. Out of her look, we're all this gold around her. Gold around. We're taking gold away, we go for hours. Yeah, go for go hours. For hours. So coming up to the second floor, we enter where they start to have bedrooms. We're gonna come back to this one here right behind me and we're gonna look at this bedroom right here. This chamber is known as the best bedroom. So this is where when George Washington came, remember I said this house was part of the Revolutionary War. George Washington came here several times. This is where most likely where he stayed. And although the decorations, the curtains, all that is not necessarily from this time, there were items collected by the museum to give you an idea of what it might have looked like. So they have the drapes, and you'll notice this on most of the bedrooms, on the beds, they have those drapes to help create another layer of privacy. So let's continue on up to the next floor, and we'll come back here, check out this other bedroom on our way down. Living my, living my, living my life like it's golden, golden, golden. Living my, living my, living my life like it's golden. So again, heading up the stairs, lined with some pictures, some very good looking guys. You can see the style of the time with their wigs going on. You know, good luck. Right here, we have His Grace William, Duke of Devonshire. This is 1755. And remember, we're gonna hear things like Sir and Duke because this is out of the English tradition. Over here, we have John Guys. And this right here is the right of Reverno by the Lortus, Lord Bishop of London. Some of you guys kind of got hair like that. <laughs> so this one right here is a major general from the army. You can see what their army garb would have looked like. Lots of hooks and buttons. He's holding some type of document. This looks like a cannon. And if you can see out into the back, it looks like there might have been a battle that recently took place. Let's see if we can figure it out. And as we come up here to the third floor, we've got one more, the Honorable John Hancock Esquire, which is something that lawyers put after the name, if anybody's interested in going into law. And he was the president of the American Congress. So again, another person involved in the founding of this country with those ideals, those ideas of liberalism and freedom on the one hand. And yet on the other hand, where did this land come from that this house is built on? Both aspects of that narrative are right here. So how in our minds do we break that down? How do we analyze that? And how do we live as Americans today in 2020 
with that history. Golden, 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 living my, living my, living my life like it's golden, 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 living my life like it's golden. I know that I'm chosen, I know that they know I'm the one. Look at me back in my city, they y'all coming with me, they seeing me go on a run. Look at me back in the stool, I'm writing these hits, it come from the heart, play it from start. Know that Up here on the third floor, we have an unfinished attic area, which might have been used for various things, whether a guest was in here or sometimes used for slave sleeping quarters. And you can see it has we have the nursery. In the 18th century, Children spent most of their time in their sleeping area. They have their bed area right here. And then on this side, they have their play area and they even do their studies over here. And then behind here is actually the most interesting part. This area leads into the servant quarters and the slave quarters. And so it's, you can see again, here, look, look at the change from here and then this part of the house is unheated which was very common in the 18th century and most slaves didn't live within the house these would have been the slaves that we're going to see their quarters right here behind me in a minute that worked in the house but not the ones who cooked the ones who cooked would have been in the kitchen which was typically separate from the house because of fires so let's take a look and see how this part of the house looks compared to this part right here. And again, we have these two competing narratives. And Van Cortland House is home to both of them. As I awake, they're killing blacks again. We confronting every murder. They movement is they don't want to wear their mask again. My words will never be enough. This just a spark. I can't always fight the opposition violence with my art. Always be the time for speaking out. I plan on buying back the block when brothers need a house. These prices meant to weed us out. I can't pledge allegiance to a flag that wasn't planted for my people. We've been shedding blood and moving needle. Never bounded by my Christian ways. In 2020, I for I might be the only way. And then this door right here would have been how the servants and the slaves accessed to the house from the back door so they don't have to go through the kids part or through where somebody else is staying you know got to keep them separate these two narratives living in the same house living in our history together yeah love five in the morning i'm still recording where i'm on the road man i'm damn near touring and why the md the md the back d-line flow i was chasing that sack old girl crazy you were blowing my line new girl say she need a little more time one day if she know that my life in this crime that is gonna work cause she's pressing that line shooters gonna blow if i tell them boy slide they gonna watch you up and leave you holy like you baptized but you so back down here on the second floor we're coming to the east bed chamber and in the 18th century they didn't have uber so after parties or balls or get togethers, they needed to have extra bedrooms for people to stay in. And so this is a typical decorations. You could see the, the curtains, the patterns of this time period. It may not be the exact original ones, but they are representative of that. And again, you can see the drapes hanging over the bed. And then right behind here, I love this piece right here. This is a dollhouse that would have been used by a girl. And you know, my son has a friend and she has a dollhouse that she got for Christmas and it doesn't look too different from that. So you can see some things change, like being able to call an Uber and go sleep in your own bed and some things stay the same. And same thing here, just like little kids in their room, they're gonna have different patterns. You can see the ABCs, the shapes, different little sayings. So again, some things change, some things stay the same. All right, let's keep going on through here. Next room is not actually decorated what it would have been like in this house. In this house, it probably would have been another living area for somebody in the house. But this room is made up in the style of what a middle class family house would have looked like in the New Amsterdam colony, a Dutch colony on the island of Manhattan in the 17th century. And so you can see they have everything all in one room. They would have cooked in here. They would have ate in here. You can see some sleeping quarters. You can see some different types of living arrangements. And so this would have been what a middle class family was living like. And so you can really see that contrast between a middle class family and somebody like the Van Cortlands, who really had that high social status and had a massive manner.
to go with it. And so as we head back downstairs, we just have one more stop inside and then we're gonna go outside to check out the herb garden. I'm walking through the clouds, I must say I love a compliment This ego trip is real, I gotta chill, it won't last longer than Finding what is real means more than this validation And so as we come back down here, we're headed into the dining room My favorite room of the house And actually, this room is done in the style of a post-revolutionary war But again, you can see some of the items similar to what we have Some of them different I know I have one of those fancy little serving things in the middle of my table With different levels of food so now we're headed out to our last spot right back out this back door here to the herb garden on this gorgeous fall day and so right out here behind me we have the herb garden this is very typical of 18th century houses to have an herb garden both for using in the kitchen and medicinal purposes do you keep herbs in your home i know i like to keep a little basil some chives some rosemary a little bit of mint you know, add some flavor and spice up to those meals. Throughout this unit, we are going to explore the enlightenment, the election, and all the questions about the American story and how we pursue our path forward with these conflicting histories that Van Cortlandt House has within its walls, both of them living and trying to rectify and examine that history and how we can understand it and make a better future moving forward. So what do you think? Is America's history more defined by its past with slavery or more by its promise of freedom for all? In this unit, we're going to grapple with those questions and we're going to learn the skills of research, using the internet, asking about where did this come from? Is it reliable? What does this mean? Providing that historical context, doing that analysis. And by the end, we're going to write personal narratives of our understanding of how these ideas from the past that inform the foundations of this country may still be or may not be relevant in 2020 to your life. So get out there and keep making history.